So, uh, good evening, my dear students. So, we are into HIP examination part three now. So, we had extensive uh, discussions in the past two uh, sessions. And I'm going slow so that you know you can uh, you know, understand the HIP examination in a much detailed manner than uh, what we have been taught. So, uh, let me thank Ashro for allowing us to do this. Um, and uh, do it in our own uh, 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 space. So it is not a putting pressure on me to complete the uh, uh, wind up the session. So really, I'm grateful for him. So now we'll leave. Uh, uh, we'll continue from where we left last time. And uh, to know what were the discussions uh, earlier, I think uh, you need to refer back uh, you know, to those uh, two talks or three uh, two talks. <laughs> So now we will proceed with measurements of the rings. That's what you know, is the next step of all about. So what is that we need to measure? There are three things we need to measure. One is the length of the limb. Second, the girth and the deformities in and around the hip joint. So this is what we need to measure. So measurement triad. Overall measurements and limb measurements. In overall measurements, you are going to look at the deformity, or to look at the limb length and the girth. So, in the limb measurements, what is that you are going to do that? One is total limb length, then eye length, and neck length. So, oh, it's clear to you what is that? You now we are going to measure it. So, what to measure? Measurement number one is the limb length measurements. Limb length measurements. There are three types or the three methods of doing measurements. What are those in length measurements? And another is the true limb length measurements. So these are the three different limb measurements which students should be familiar with. Now, uh, shortening and lengthening, when we measure these, there are two things we measure. One is apparent shortening, other is true shortening, and in lengthening also again apparent true. Now, what are the screening tests? <laughs> helps us to measure the Balance of the galaxy sign. Here, what we do is, it is X to 60. The feet is made level at the feet. Here, the feet level at the heel. The knee is close to 19 and the heel close to 60. So now, normally what happens is, both the knees are at the same level. If the level is short, there is a short thing. Then, if uh, you know, the knee will be shorter, that means short thing is in the feet one. If the leg is pushed forward like this, then the short thing is in the leg. So, this is a screening test to find out the short thing, where it is. Is it in the thigh or is it in the leg? Now, apparent measurements. Now, how will we record that? In apparent, apparent measurements, in supine position, how will we do that? One minute, just hold on. Is that a video, sir? No, no. Uh, I think one or two slides have skipped. That's what I'm trying to find out. Whether you know it is decent about the slides. Yes. One minute. I'm checking. Just just bear bear with me for a minute. Yeah, I think it's okay. I think we're fine. Okay, now, apparent measurements. So, in the supine position, how do we do that? Patient is supine, you don't square the pelvis. Both the limbs are brought parallel by manipulating the unaffected limb. The measurements from any fixed central point. Uh, can be taken. Uh, any discrepancy, the measurement has to be noted. And the measurement you are taking from where the CTX central point could be either the tip of the CT sternum, the tip of the medial malleolus on either side. So, this is how an apparent measurement is carried out in supine position. This is how it shows you know, the, the measurement, how you do uh, the apparent measurement, and what does that show? What does apparent measurement show? It shows compensation. 
the patient has developed to conceive any fixed deformity. Here, both the limbs should be kept parallel to each other. This is very important. Now, if the limbs are not parallel to each other, then it's difficult for you to measure the apparent measurements. Then, measure from the thickest of the follicles to the medium Thus, And what is the significance of this apparent measurement? What does it the extent to which spine and pelvis have adopted to keep the limb off brings the center of gravity towards the median plane. Postural equalization of the limbs stabilizes the unstable hip. It affects the apparent length discrepancy and not the true discrepancy. This natural compensation is cosmetically acceptable. That means the apparent measurements. The, 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 it conceals the deformity cosmetically. What are the limitations of this significance? What are the limitations of apparent measuring, measurements? It is not useful in bilateral hip affections. So, oh, this is clear to you. Now, apparent trend, what it does is it is cosmetically and functional. So, it is you know, trying to compensate the the, uh, the, 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 the beginning length discrepancy cosmetically and functionally too. How do you do the two measurements in standing positions? You can do it in supine position, which I have told you, and also in standing positions. This is the block test of the call. It's done in ambulatory patients for shortening of the limb to measure the shortening of the limb. Okay, now we have committed two measurements. Not into apparent measurements. Apparent measurements, I told you how to do it in the supine position. And now the true measurements be done one in the standing position. This is called a block test. Here, what we do is patient stands close to the wall. The anterior superior, uh, superior index spine is you know at a lower level here. So instruct the patient to move the limb up. ASI starts moving upwards. When the ASI comes to the horizontal level, Insert a measured wooden block within the foot to keep it level. Now measure the height of this block. The measure is the linear discrepancy. Suppose there is lengthening. So ASI remains at the higher side. Move the normal limb towards the midline. ASI will become level. Now at the height of the block, this is the amount of lengthening of the opposite limb. So, hope you understood how to do the true measurements in standing position, shortening and lengthening both. Now, in supine position, how do we do the true measurements? Total length of the lower limb has to be measured, measured from the anterior superior index spine to the tip of the medial narrowness. So, the steps are patient is in supine position. You need to square the pelvis by manipulating the affected limb. Now, Keep the unaffected limb in the same position. This is mandatory. So you understand, once you square the pelvis, you have to keep the unaffected limb in the same position as the affected limb. Now mark the ASIS. Next, next mark the tip of the medial malleolus. Now measure the distance between these two points. Do it on the opposite side. Compare the two measurements and find out the difference. Now you will get the actual shot. What are the limitations of this method? You cannot follow this method if you cannot square the pelvis. Or if ASIS is not palpable, which situation is not palpable? If the patient is obese or if there is iatrogenic removal as in bone grafting, not useful in bilateral shortening. It does not identify the location of the true shortening, whether it is in the leg or femur. And above or below the trochanter. So these are the limitations of the true measurements. So you need to learn how to mark these two, three points for true measurements. One is air size, just by your metal tip, gradual of the equine The first boarding point, what you hit, is the air size, and you need to mark the you need you need to know how to mark the medial joint line. Just palpate the gap in between the, the lower end of the uh, you know, femur and upper end of tibia. You feel a gap there, move the knee joint and identify the joint line, and then mark it. And then slide the, the metal tip and 
touch that line, and that is how you know you will be taking measurement from that point. And the medial manuals, you just mark it from below, you know, upwards, you slide it on which it hits is the medial manuals. Now, having marked these three points, so for true measurements, unlike in apparent measurements, you don't, you know, you need to square the pelvis here. Okay. So what to square the pelvis? From the A side, the line to the median manuals. So this is how you are going to measure the length of the technique of uh, doing the true measurement. So in the local examination, apparent length measurement, it is functional length which helps in assessing the extent of natural compensation developed develop for concealing the actual deformity, disability, or tilting the pelvis sidewards. True shortening is equal to apparent shortening. That means there is no compensation. Apparent length, bilateral bi length equal, there is full compensation. That means there is no apparent shortening. True, sh uh, true shortening is more than apparent shortening. Only part of the deformity compensated by tilting the pelvis, that is the fixed abduction deformity. True shortening, less than apparent shortening, fixed abduction deformity with shortening and no compensation. For every 10 degree deformity, there's one centimeter shortening. And then um, the apparent shortening is equal to true shortening plus abduction deformity. And apparent shortening is equal to true shortening minus abduction before. So these are some of the points which you need to ponder, think, first practice, develop the correct technique of doing the measurements. And then you can do the inference this way. You can keep this in your mind and uh, try to uh, find out what exactly you are having in the given case. Now whether you know, the apparent shortening, the, the, the true shortening, True measurements, how to correlate each one, you know, can be done once you do a proper measurement. Vital interpretations of apparent and true, importance of apparent measurement, again, I'm repeating, it consists of a penetration mechanism. If true shortening is equal to the apparent shortening, that means there is no conversation. If true shortening is more than the apparent shortening, then it is fixed abduction deformity. If true shortening is less than the apparent shortening, then it is fixed abduction deformity. So fix this in your mind so that it will be easy for you to interpret the case. Now, having done the measurement, now you come to the measurement number two, that is visual measurement. Overall, you saw how to do the limb length measurements, apparent and true. Now, the regional measurement. So, for length of the thigh, what is that you do? Uh, first, carry out the same step mentioned above. Now, mark the medial joint line of the knee. Measure the distance between the ASIS and this line. Now, do it on the opposite side. Compare both the measurements and find out the difference. If there is difference, then it indicates thigh short length. I think there is nothing much to worry. I think this is very easy to understand. But is it an ideal method? Answer is no. Why? Maybe it is difficult to mark these things. Or possible if there is joint effusion, if there is malunion in the region of the knee joints, not able to mark it. Joint line tenderness in arthritis, which is not cooperative, so you cannot mark it. And if the patient has undergone knee joint surgery, then it becomes difficult for you, difficult for you to mark the median joint line. What are the better options? Really? Now we don't know whether this is really a better option. Upper border of the patella can be an option, but the problem is the patella is movable, so it may not be the right thing. And other chapter could, could be another option, but the disadvantage is it is unpalpable. So still, this medial joint iron is the much better option to do the medial measurement of the thigh or the leg, only in exceptional situation, which I have enumerated on the slide. You may have difficulty in doing it. And can immobilization have been measured directly? Can you do that directly? Now, that was the indirect way of measurement. Can you do it directly? Yes, the answer is yes. And uh, it can be done directly in patients or in individuals who are thin. If they are obese, it's difficult for you to do it. So, what do you need to do? You need to mark the upper border of the trochanter. And you should know how to mark the trochanter. It's like, you know, you are, uh, you know, upwards and 
the 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 end of the the upper border or where you eat uh, cut there is no resistance that is the upper border of your cancer. So you need to mark that then mark the two compared on both sides. So this is another way of measuring the limb length or the regional measurements uh, in, in the field. So this is uh, something which is easy. Now, how do you do it in the leg? How do you do it in the leg? Into all the further mentioned steps. Now measure the distance between the medial joint line and the tip of the medial manulus. Compared, we can do easily. Now, how do we put this? Where is the shortening of the lower limb? Is it in the thigh or in the leg? Suppose it between the side, thigh, then whether it is above the trunk entrance or below the trunk entrance, we need to find out. If it, the shortening is in the lower limb, that is below the knee joint, then it could be due to mal union of the leg or non union of the leg or the tibial bones. Now, the shortening now is easy to find out by the internal measurements. Where is the shortening? Whether it's the thigh or non leg. Suppose if it is in the thigh, the next question that arises is where is it? Is it above the throat and not below the throat? That's for that, we need to find out. We'll discuss that further. And if it is in the leg, it could be either due to mal union or non so, where is the shortening? Meaning whether it is above or below the trochanter. So, to analyze this, these are the tests which are at your available at your disposal. What are those? Brand's test, Milatin's line, Shoemaker's line, Morris's bitrochantric line, Kine's line. So, shortening is present in all fractures and dislocations except obturic type of anterior dislocation where there is lending. So, that is a point which you should keep. In mind. Now, let us see these individual uh, the, the techniques. What is the uh, the the Brian's triangle? One minute. It will open, sir. Okay. Yeah. 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 The Brian's test. So. How do you do the branch test? I think you are all familiar with this test. Now you need to mark the address and the tip of the great trochanter in connecting the ASIS to the great trochanter, that is line number one. Then line perpendicular from ASIS towards the back with the second line. And the line connecting the great trochanter to line B is the third line. So, you should draw these lines correctly. Instead, <laughs> what are the types of lines? One is digital, digital branch triangle, geometrical branch triangle, and reverse branch triangle. There are three types of branch triangle. Now, let us see each one. What is this digital you know, branch triangle? It is used for the screening purposes. You don't draw lines here. You just use your thumb, middle finger, and index finger. The thumb is placed on the ASIS, middle finger is placed on the greater trochanter, and index finger is placed on the imaginary, imaginary perpendicular line. So this you know is just you know drawing the line using your thumb, middle, and index fingers. You create this triangle and a quick analysis for you to screen the, the, the shorting where it is. So that is digital branch triangle. But in examination, in the practical examination, don't rely on this. Go and do the actual drawings and then calculate the branch triangle. Then, geometrical branch triangle is the right angle triangle. The shortening of the face here, shortening is in the head, neck, uh, uh, or dislocation of the hip. It's the shortening of the face. If there is shortening of the hypotenuse, then it could be central dislocation of the hip, old fracture, neck of the or crucial absence of head, etc. Shortening of the perpendicular line, internal rotation of the head and trochanter, flexion hip contractures, joint destructions, and in trochanter fractures, the length of the line will increase. So, this is about geometric branch triangle, which you are supposed to draw, and this is how you are going to infer. Whether there is shortening of the base 
or shortening of the hypotenuse or shortening of the perpendicular line. Find out and if you, you know, know what are all the possible you know, uh, diagnosis uh, of shortening of various lines, then I think you will be uh, yeah, almost inching towards the correct diagnosis. Then, what is reversed branch triangle? It is done in gross overriding of the trochanter. Here, the BT is drawn above the perpendicular line. Shortening will be, that is, the branch triangle is drawn above the perpendicular line. The shortening will be some total of the base of the reverse triangle plus normal branch triangle. So, this is what is known as the reverse branch triangle where there is gross overriding of the trochanter. So, the branch triangle is reversed here. So, you need to know what is this. If the examiner asks, you should be able to tell this. Then, when there is true shortening, whether it is supra trochanter or infra trochanter, find out. Suppose if it's supra trochanteric, then this could be the possible diagnosis which you are looking at. Cox Avera, Pertis, Capital Pivotal Crisis, Mal United, you know, basal neck fractures, non union of the fracture, neck of him, congenital Cox Averas, arthritis, and dislocation. If it is infra trochanteric, then it could be mal union of the fracture, V1 and DVA, growth arrest from polio, or it could be due to trauma. So, Shorting, supra trochanteric, mild, moderate, severe. If it is mild, supra trochanteric shortening, then the diagnosis could be either an arthritis, fibrous or unia ankylosis, coxavera, post sepsis sequelae, malunited neck fractures, and fibrous nonunia, central fracture dislocation. If the supra trochanteric shortening is moderate, then it could be mild united trochanteric fracture, non union of the neck. Severe shortening, dislocations, and tongs with arthritis. Here, look for infra trochanteric shortening as well because of the associated involvement. So, if it is severe shortening, it could be dislocation or destruction of the joint because of tongs with arthritis. Many of this will be associated with tendon involvement when there is no pain. Because there is shortening of the legal arm and disturbance of the ground. What are the limitations of triangle strength? It is not useful in bilateral hip disease. It is not useful if there is limb. ASIS is excised, then uh, because of bone graft and the surgeries, then again this test is not going to be useful to you. Now, let us come to the Second a line, which is important to keep measurements, that is the relaxed line. So, how do you do that? Here, the patient lies on the normal side, hip and knee are flexed to 90 degrees. Then, a line is drawn from the sharp bony point on each gelosity here to the ESIS. This line should just touch the trochanter. You can see here, just the trochanter, just touch the trochanter. What is the advantage of the relevant slide? There is no need of a comparison with the other side. Right triangle, you have to compare with the other side. Whereas, the relevant slide can be done unilaterally. You know, it will tell whether there is shortening of the supra, I mean the trochanter, uh, or overriding of the trochanter easily by, you know, doing the relevant slide. You do not have to compare it on the side. So, this is how you, know, you should do the, 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 the reliance line. You can see here, if it is normal, it is just touch here. If it is normal, you can see the point measurement of the idea of supraarthrogatic shopping. Then, what are the line and T's test? What is the shoemaker's line? Uh, the line is drawn from the greater trochanter to the ASIS on both sides. Then the lines meet at the midline or if it is away and below the umbilicus, that means it is unilateral lining up of the trochanter. In the bilateral shortening, line will meet below the umbilicus but in the center. So this is the advantage or this is the significance of shoemaker's line. Then what about the keyless test? Okay. Line joining the two ASIS line 
is parallel to the line joining both the crater trochanter. That is normal. More is a spike trochanteric test here. The distance from the crater trochanter to the pubic surfaces on both the sides is the Morris's white trochanteric test. So this is how the shoemaker's line is done, and this is how the key is test is done. We can see here the shoemaker's line, how the line should meet in the main line, and if there is a pathology, and you can see that the shoemaker's line, the genius line also, you can see that the lines are not parallel. Okay, and you can see here this is angulated, this here. So this is for writing of the trochanter. Then voice is by trochanter test. You measure the distance between these two, the pubic symphysis and this line. And you can see that the discrepancy in the length every 13 centimeters and this tells you about the affected head. Normally it should be equal on both sides. So those are all the different tests which you are should be familiar with. Now the girth, this is measurement number three. Now, how do you do the gut measurements? Uh, should be done at the thigh and at the leg level. Here, the steps are patient is in the supine position. The limbs are kept parallel and straight. Mark a point from the ASIS from the, uh, or from the knee joint. About 18 centim a centimeter from either of the points. From here, you mark 18 centimeters. Do it on the other side also. Uh, can be taken at the mid thigh too. This is the idea at the mid thigh. Now measure the circumference of the thigh, both the sides, find out the difference. That indicates the amount of wasting the patient has. The problems arises in bony enlargements like tumors, osteomyelitis, malignant of the leg, long bones, except the girth of the thigh could be increased. Otherwise, it would be normally wasting. Right? So this is very simple. And this is how we do the thigh measurement, and this is how we do the leg measurement, you mark a point about 18 centimeters up and then measure on both the sides. Leg measurement, again, this is the one which is over here. The patient is in the supine position. Mark a point of same distance on leg either from the knee joint or from the medial malleolus. Measure, get up and compare. Now, you come to the special tests, which are very important in examination. What are those? These are the tests for stability in adults and children. Test 1 the straight leg blazing test to rule out any involvement of the spine. Test 2 Tregelenberg test. Test 3 Telescopy test. In infants, Autolani test and Barlow's test. Anyway, in the practical examination, you are not going to be given any infants there. So it is going to be the, the adult patient, and you should know the significance of these three tests. And you should know how to perform this three test. Test one, straight leg raising test. In a normal hip, SLR is possible up to 80 to 90 degrees. Possible if there is intact stabilum, head, neck, femur, and stable hip and knee joints. If you are able to do the straight leg raise easily, normally, that means your water. Very normal lower limb, right from the hip joint to the knee joint. So that's what is the significance of a straight leg raising test. Now we come to the test two, that is Tendulkar test. He is the pioneer, you know, of uh, you know this very important test in orthopedics. In 1895, Frederick Tendulkar described a clinical sign useful for detecting the function of the hip octatal muscle with special reference to CDH and progressive muscular dystrophy. The AFRI system of orthopedics describes Tendulkar test as follows. Normally, each leg weighs half the body weight. When one leg is lifted, the other takes the entire weight. As a result, the trunk has to incline towards the weight-bearing leg. This is achieved by the hip of the calves. Their insertion is fixed. Pull is exerted on the origin. So the pelvic stays. Raises on the non stance side. If this mechanism fails, then you have got a gentle work test which is positive. The pelvis drops instead of rising on the non stance side. So 
do the residual material, what are the requirements? It, since it has the after term mechanism on the hip that consists of fulcrum, which is the hip joint, lever arm, which is the head and the neck, and the power is supplied with the after terms. What are the prerequisites to do a tendal and body test? First and foremost, you should have free abduction and erection of at least 20 degrees. Patient should be able to stand on the upper tendon for more than 30 seconds. And age of the patient should be above 5. So these are the prerequisites to do a Chandelenburg test. If you do not have these requisites, then do not attempt to do the Chandelenburg test. Now how do you do the Chandelenburg test? Step 1. Performing the standard Chandelenburg test with hip mess at 30 degrees. Examiner or you stand behind the patient. Watch the shoulder level. Watch the scapular level. Watch the iliac crest and watch the gluteal pole from behind. So this is step one. Step two. Patient is asked to raise one leg off the ground with the hip flexed to 30, 0 to 30 degrees and patient balances himself. Flex the knee till foot clears the ground to nullify the effect of rectus femoris muscle. Now note the position of the pelvis. Supporting stick can be given on weight bearing side or both the shoulders supported can be supported by the examiner. So this is step 2. That means patient is asked to raise the limb to 30 degrees, flex the to 30 degrees and see what happens to the balance. Once balanced, the patient is asked to raise the non stance side as high as possible. First, you ask the patient to raise it up to 30 degrees of the inflection. Then, once the patient is balanced, then you should instruct the patient to raise the non stance limb as high as possible. And when the patient is doing that, you need to support on the stance side. You can see the examiner is supporting on the start side. Right. Now, what is that you need to do? If the drop on the opposite side is less than 5 degrees, it is normal. Only if the drop is more than 5 degrees, it is considered abnormal. The patient should be able to hold the pelvis steady for 30 seconds. If unable to hold for more than 30 seconds, it is, no, it is positive. False positive is seen in 10% of the patients. This should not be done. You should not support on the non stance side. Non stance side. This may act as a fulcrum to the latissimus dorsi, quadratus laborum, and paraspinal muscles. So you should not support on the non stance side. Then, step four. If the patient leans too far over the side of the weight bearing hip, examiner needs to correct it by gentle pressure on the shoulders here. This brings the vertebra prominence over the center of the hip and as the vertebra comes on the center. So that is step four. Why does the pelvis go up? Hip abductor on the weight bearing side. Here, what happens is the insertion is fixed and the pull is exerted on the origin. Consequently, the pelvis will tilt down, rising on the side, not taking the weight. So this is why the 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 the, the, the action uh, happens. No, at the, 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 the origin, and this is gets fixed. Normally, it is the other way around, but here, you know, it is the opposite. So, what is the hip abduction mechanism? There, the fulcrum is the hip joint, lever is the head, neck, and you know, the, the head and neck of the femur, and the power is the gluteus. Yes, so this you need to understand properly. Now, Interpretation of the tendon number test is very important. When do you say the test is normal or the test is negative? If the pelvis or the non stance can be elevated as high as the hip of is allowed on the stance side, if this can be maintained for 30 seconds, compensatory scoliosis develops convex to the stance side. And the vertebral prominence is centered over the hip and the foot. That is when you see that the, the, the test is normal or negative. Okay. 
Now, when do you say the test is positive or abnormal? Interpretation one. If the previous mentioned things cannot be done, pelvis drops on the non stand side. If elevation on the non stand side is not maximal, not maximal, this is known as the zero time tunnel bulge test. That means the elevation is not maximal. It just elevates, and when it go beyond 30 degrees, when it flex the head, the elevation does not happen to the maximal side. This is the zero time tunnel bulge test. Buttocks of the crease moves downwards, abduction of the weight bearing in our head, the compensated scoliosis is convex to the non stance side. If you find this, then, then the test is abnormal or the test is positive. That is the interpretation number one. Then, what is interpretation number two? Abnormal or positive? What is interpretation number two? Tunnel bulge test is done. Pelvis, pelvis elevates on the non stand side, but pelvis cannot be maintained at the elevated position for more than 30 seconds. It drops. Now you need to measure the time taken to drop. Recording the time helps to use the test objectively for comparison purposes. It is not enough just to observe that the pelvis is dropping, but you need to record the Time the pelvis takes to drop. So, this will help you to do the test objectively for comparison purposes. That means you need to have a stopwatch to do the tunnel retrieval test. Tunnel retrieval test with the non stance hip flex to 90 degrees. Three responses can happen here. At the non stance hip no, is flexed. Response one pelvis rises on the non stance side, but not as much as in the 30 degree. Then, reason here, so the reason for that is pelvic rotation brought the iliac crest closer to the cage and makes it makes the spinal compensation uncomfortable. Then, response two, the pelvis may remain, in par remain parallel to the ground. Or, the response three, pelvis does not drop on the, the non stance side. So, this is tendon and test done with 90 degrees of hip flexion. Normally, we do it 30 degrees, and then when we do it 90 degrees, this could be the interpretation. What is a non-valid response? Presence of back pain or leg pain while you are with patients who are less than five years of age, and then mentally unstable patients. In the above circumstances, positive tests can be misleading. Thus, just looking at the trans iliac neck is not enough to assess the abductor muscle function. But a negative test is significant. It means that the patient does not have the abnormal hip mechanic, mechanics. But if the test is positive, then there could be some confusions which you need to have a clear concept in your mind. What is delayed positive retinal test? Described by Michel in 1973. Several people have an initial negative test. But after standing for a short time in the pelvis space, it gradually begins to fall. This is what is known as delayed positive pedal bulk sign. This is seen in patients with minimal weakness of the upper charmus. The time and Pelvis, the time at which the pelvis should be noted. In these patients, normal. So, no, this can be misleading. But when asked to walk quickly, they report fatigue and hip. All the classical signs of pelvis now become obvious. So, this is Michel's delayed positive frontal work test. Normal, it is normal initially, but after 30 seconds, it drops and becomes positive and if this happens it is because of the weakness in the pectoral which is minimal and then and then the important thing is you need to you know and then know the record the time and then when the patient walks it appears that the patient is having a normal gait but you, when you ask the patient to walk briskly then they, there is you know the fatigue and leg which comes up then you have the classical test coming up when this test can be flashed 
false positive or false negative. I am going slow with the cadre number test because this is one thing which is always confusing to the students. Even I was you know, finding it difficult to answer Dr. Puri when I had got a case of PDP uh, uh, and he was asking so many questions on general methods, which honestly I was not all aware. What I knew when I was a student was just need to raise your leg and if the pelvis goes up, it is normal. If the pelvis drops on the sides, it's normal. Beyond that, I didn't know anything. I only thought that it is just now. Okay, which is being tested. But Tendal work test is much more than all this. So I'm trying to give you a proper insight into the general level test. What are the false positive tests? If the patient has got pain, they do false positive test. If children less than four years of age, poor cooperation, is bad balance, poor, poor pelvic impingement, problems with the quadratus lumborum muscles, cerebral palsy, sacroiditis, mechanical problems of the legs like poor knees. Old leg, mal united femur and tibia, ovaries and bulky people. So here the test could be false positive. And what is assisted tendon work? Where the examiner or the student assists the person like this while doing the tendon work. This is known as the assisted tendon work test. What are the false negative tendon work test? Use of supra pelvic muscles above the pelvis is supra pelvic muscles come into action here. Use of rectus femoris and swax, shifting the torso well over the way very side. This is called quick movements. And in children less than four years, you can get false negative tests. So it is this is evident in neurological disorders. How do they do these trick movements? How do the patient do the trick movements when there are these neurological you know, problems? Uh, uh, and we are doing, doing, doing a tendon work test where it could be false negative. They move the torso well beyond the weight bearing head. This reduces the amount of optical cut activity by supporting the hand on a table or wall on the north stance side. This helps the contraction of the shoulder adductors and psoas major on the north stance side and quadrants lumbar on the stance side. So this is our false negative tendon work test. Have extensive discussion with your colleagues. Discuss about tendon work test. False positive, false negative. Various steps or techniques of doing tendon work test. So have the discussion. Try to understand this whole concept properly. It will pay you know well in the examination. Now why tendon work test is unreliable in children less than five years? This may be of interest. The examiner may ask you. Uh, you may not get in, uh, a, a, a child less than five years from keep uh, pathology uh, most of the times, but we never know in the national exams they may keep this kind of case. Why it is unreliable? Because the child cannot understand your commands. The child will not cooperate fully with you, so assessment is not valid. So there could be different responses on the same day, the same patient. That is why not reliable children. So. What are the highlights? Our ability to assume the response is absolute. If the pelvis elevates or drops on the non stance and we feel that the second, the test is positive. Use of timer is required to assess this. I, as a student, never used a timer. I didn't know that we should measure this drop. I never knew that. But now I think you should understand that it is always better you use a timer. So that if you can actually calculate the drop and it helps us in the severity the order okay, mechanics. What are the importance of the standardized timed tendon and bulk test? It's not just standardized test, it's standardized timed tendon and bulk test. It is an accurate clinical sign. It's got prognostic implications. Gait and tendon and test allows the functional assessment of the gait. But gait assessment requires space. You need a room where the patient can walk around to assess the functional assessment, to do a functional assessment of the gait. But if you do the tendon by test, you know, you can, it can be done in a confined space, unlike the gait. It is more valuable than many static tests. It can be easily recorded on film or video tape. Patient with abnormal tendon test has an inefficient gait and hence easily fatigue. 
Timing is an essential part of this. It helps measure delayed abnormal response. It provides an objective measure of improvement or deterioration in the function of the head. This is the prognostic implication of internal balance. In QSU gives you an objective measurement of improvement or deterioration in the function of the head. So it has got prognostic value, not just diagnostic value. So if the examiner asks you, if you come out with this answer, then I think you have impressed the examiner and they are not going to sort of work in it. Okay. Then, there are three mechanisms of tenor blood test, which I did know as a student. I always thought this is a problem of the you know, hip abductor mechanism. No, it is not just that. It is a problem in the supra-pelvic pathology also. Pelvic pathology, this we have discussed now, pulmonary liver power. And infra-pelvic, it could be due to the medial deviation of the mechanical axis of the lower leg. That means that the tenor blood test can be positive. Not only in the hip abductor mechanism technology, but also in the supra pelvic when there is post pelvic inflicting treatment as in scoliosis or infra pelvic due to the medial deviation of the mechanical axis of the lower legs. Now, here is an example. How to differentiate? Here, if there is a if there is a OAD, the genu alum deformity, here you will have candelan blood test positive, right? So how? How to differentiate the positive tendon blood test due to intrapelvic causes during the normal monocoral weight bearing, medial part of the thigh, which is parallel to the mechanical axis of the femur, that is perpendicular. In in the tendon blood uh, test due to the pelvic causes, thigh is adapted at the hip, a bit inclined obliquely inwards like that. In the positive Kettleman test, due to infra pelvic causes, medial part of the thigh, that this is the medial part of the thigh, is abducted at the hip. So, you understand, if it is due to pelvic causes, thigh is adducted at the hip. If it is due to infra pelvic causes, thigh is abducted at the hip. Part of the limb, distal to the deformity, is oriented obliquely at inverse, like that. So, one, the medial border of the thigh is abducted if the tendon test is positive because of the infra pelvic causes. And the limb distal to the deformity is oblique and inverse. So that is how you should differentiate between the infra pelvic and the pelvic causes. So we need to go in reference to this genius, the, the Frederick, who described it in 1895. Where the X-rays were not available, had come just two years before and was not available as a diagnosis. His observations in 1895 are as precise, or it does not be put upon. So it's also so precise and clear even, even to this day. His interpretations are very accurate then and even now. Now it's up to you to understand it properly. Spend some time uh, you know, discuss this you know, issues with your uh, you know, colleagues. And uh, perform all these tests properly uh, uh, with the patient, and I'm sure that you will reach uh, uh, the, the, the benefits of this. Then, the test three. The first one was the straight leg raising test for hip stability. Second was the Trendelen work test, which was discussed at length. Now, you have got the telescopic test, test of hip instability. How do you do? What is the method? Here, the patient is fine. The hip is flexed to 60 to 90 degrees. The knee is flexed to 90 degrees and slightly adapted. Slightly adapted. Pelvis is fixed by the thumb at the ASIS. Here you can see pelvis is fixed. Right? The hand is used to palpate the head of the femur. First, pull the leg and then apply a longitudinal force like this. First, pull it. And then apply a longitudinal force in the long axis of the femur. Don't just try to push it like that. You know, once you put the hip in this position, don't try to push the limb down and do a stability test, that is telescopic test. First, pull it out and then push it down. So, first pull and then apply a longitudinal force in the long axis of the femur. Then you can feel 
the head of the femur is dislocated or in non inner fracture neck of the femur you can feel the head of the femur hitting against your palm or your fingers or conditions when you get this telescopic test tube when there is old and reduced posterior hip dislocation when there is non inner fracture neck of femur and rarely to kind of wandering the scapula as in tuberculosis third is stone arthroplasty where the hip joint has been excised old pathological dislocation of the hip now in these conditions you can get this telescopic test post what the caution you should exercise there will be some amount of normal expression so suddenly don't conclude that there is a, 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 there, there is a unstable hip normally also you will feel that there is some expression it is positive only if the excursion is more the excursion is more it is like the anterior droid test what we do for the 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 the, the acl tears there will be normal excursions only if it is beyond that then you say it is abnormal so don't just uh, jump to a conclusion if there is some movement happening don't say the test is positive the test should be positive don't you should tell the test is positive only when there is a significant shift in the uh, hip so special tests other important tests you cannot ignore now you learn about straight leg raising test cantilever bar test tennis to test but there are some special tests which you need to know there are the gowens test patrick's test grace test elise test erickson test and hart sign so let us see one by one what is the patrick test it's a flexion abduction external rotation test called the faber test so this is a screening test for hip pathology if this is normal then the hip if it can do the faber test on the patrick test correctly the pain there is no pathology in hip joint positive the test leg you know, remains above the level of the normal leg if the leg remains above the pain the test is positive these are the special tests which you should know other than the cantilever and the telescopic test what is the grace test is it is done to measure the antiversion and the retroversion yeah. <laughs> patient is poor you palpate the posterior aspect of the greater trochanter rotate the hip till the greater trochanter becomes parallel to the floor and then between the vertical and the lower leg also known as the rider's test the grace test done to measure the antiversion retroversion these are the theory theoretical aspects unless you do this practically all the patients will not get this concept right you need to do this and then practice it then only you will know how to do the antiversion and the retroversion analysis quadriceps or elis test here yeah, the patient is prone knee is flexed compare the contralateral side for the range of movements if the hip also flexes the quadriceps is considered to be tight also known as the rectus femoris contracture test then you have the pelvic elis test Here the patient is lying on the side. The hip is flexed. The practitioner stabilizes the hip, and the downward pressure is applied to the knee, forcing the leg into adduction. The inference is tightness and or pain of hip and buttocks are indicative of the piriformis tightness. So the piriformis test. Then you have got the 1990 hamstring test. Here the patient is fine. Hip is flexed to 90 degrees. Knee is Neck flex to 90 degrees. Slowly extend the knee. The patient cannot get to less than 20 degrees of knee flexion. The hamstrings are considered to be tight. So this is the 1990 hamstring test. Overs test for IT band tightness. No. This is how it is done. Test for SI joint, Marys's, Morris's, bitrochanteric, bitrochanteric compression test. That is test for SI joints. The other special tests are the Erickson sign for sacroiliac disease, R sign for abduction limitation in the DDH, axis deviation. How do you find out the axis deviation? On full flexion of the hip and knee, limb is directed to the ipsilateral shoulder. Normally, it points towards the contralateral shoulder. But if there is an axis problem, then when you flex the hip, it will it will point towards the The ipsilateral shoulder, so that is another important sign. What is the sectoral sign? Here, internal rotation restricted when the hip is 90 degrees flexed, then goes into external rotation. So here, the internal rotation is restricted 
when heat is to 90 degrees and heat goes into external rotation that is the sectoral sign. What is the dissolved sign? On passive rotation of the femur, arc of the rotation of braided trochanter is smaller in neck of femur branches. So these are some of the additional tests you need to know. Uh, may not be that important, but if you know this, it's always better. So that now if the question comes up in the examination, we can answer the exam. Then this is in infants, the hip stability test, or the lattice test, and Barlow's test. I think you're all aware this era, hip and knees flexed at 90 degrees, the middle finger the base of the weighted trochanter, both the sides. The thumb is at the lesser trochanter here, the thumb is here, and the palms are encircling the knee. You after and externally rotate. Positive if the head reduces with the span. That is auto is test. Barlow's provocative test. First phase, you adapt and put the axial pressure. Put the axial pressure. Second phase, you adapt and push it with a little finger. And inference is head dislocatable or not. So you adapt and put an axial pressure, abduct and push it with a little finger. This is the Barlow's provocative test. These are the hip uh, stability tests in infants. Other findings which you should be looking for in the joints are tenderness for arthritis and non -hitting. swelling in arthritis and look for some masses in and around, look for abscesses or bone scars or old sinuses, look for surgical scars, look for classical deformities and body of the trochanter. And look for other findings elsewhere, trochanter deformity, not only of the hand, and of the elbow, shoulder. Another other foot like psoriatic you know, patches, cephalized spots in fibrous dysplasia, short stitches in spondyloidal partial dysplasia, stiff bent spine or in like liver enlargement of the alcoholic with the avascular necrosis now could be a possibility. So other important examinations in the internet now has to examine. You need to examine the motor power of the lower limbs and you need to uh, examine the relevant blood vessels, popliteal artery, anterior posterior tibial arteries, and dorsal uh, spirit artery. And you need to look for the lymph nodes. Most importantly, you should know how to do a PR examination. And the best way to feel the head of the femur, which is out of the posture, especially central uh, lip joint dislocation. So, PR examination is a great factor. If the head is absent, try to find where it is. If it is absent in three situations, three D. Dislocation, dissolution, destruction. Dislocation, look for trochanter and head both. Where is the trochanter and where is the head? Dissolution, total destruction as in septic arthritis, non split arthritis. Destruction, as can happen in tuberculosis or septic arthritis. So these are the three things where you will find that head is. Absolutely.